scientists' approaches to charismatic species conservation. <clears throat> so we know that charismatic species have an outsized impact on conservation through heightened public interest and significant focus in terms of research um, and conservation investment. And with this added attention and related emotions eliciting complex impacts on conservation. So in trying to define charismatic species, it's actually, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the term charismatic species or larger the term charisma. And it was really interesting because in trying to define charismatic species, I actually had a difficult time finding like a succinct agreed upon definition. Um, but I did find these uh, list of, of attributes or list of factors um, in the literature. <clears throat> And I think this is likely due to uh, charisma, uh, the concept of charisma both being subjective and relative. Um, so there is, I did establish a, um, or I did go by um, a few factors established by Ducarme um, for non-human charisma, which included detectable and distinctive socioeconomic biases, so shared social perceptions, aesthetics, and the potential to generate satisfaction. Um, and all, all in all with these, uh, with the attention placed on charismatic species and the re related emotions to it, um, they definitely elicit complex impacts on conservation. So that's why I was interested in looking at kind of a case study, especially on the human dimension social science side. Um, so social science approaches, I was really interested in looking at a broad array of applications of social science methods because social science is most often included in the final stages of research um, in education and outreach. Um, but the, the integration of social sciences and the recognition of integrating social sciences is definitely increasing to include problem form formulation, data collection, analysis, theory development. Um, so I wanted to look at that on a, on a I wanted to use social sciences on a bigger quantitative method. Um, and I wanted to expand my own social science toolbox. I had experience in human dimensions specifically, um, but I wanted to kind of expand those methods. Quick table of contents, because we're going to be going through it. I'll go over my first chapter, and then my second chapter, and then my third chapter, and then I'll go over the conclusions. <laughs> so my chapter one dealt with exotic non-traditional pets. Um, and non-native and invasive species threaten biodiversity, economies, they can be a threat to human health and well-being, um, with the pet trade being a major introduction pathway, a known established introduction pathway of these non-native species, especially herpet fauna and fish. Um, but you might be asking yourself, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, they're charismatic, question mark. Um, for many, they do elicit strong emotions and a desire to collect which can fall under that category of non-human charisma. <clears throat> um, and in addition, the reptile trade itself, so specifically reptiles, are driven by a number of commonly traded species considered charismatic and inexpensive. And then on the other side of it, there's also the special collectors who are interested in the more designer, rare, expensive, attractive species. So all falling in line with uh, factors of charisma. Uh, so a question I had and wanted to explore further was, uh, we know that the pet trade is an invasion pathway via releases and escapes. Uh, and there's a need though, to understand the contributing factors to these releases and escapes. Um, and one of the concepts that has been looked at is potentially uh, releases potentially related to level of attachment to these non-traditional pets. In fact, a study, a, the, a most recent study uh, found that avoidant attachment pet caretaking increases the likelihood of surrendering a pet. So uh, further evidence that there's owners, th there's evidence that owners of reptiles, birds, and cats exhibit higher levels of avoidant attachment compared to dogs. So, excuse me, what I was interested in doing was taking a known scale. So the Lexington attachment to pet scale, which has been used many times on cat and dog owners or traditional pet owners, um, and apply it to non-traditional pets. So my research question was uh, re exactly related to that. What is the relationship between the lapse instrument and non-traditional pet ownership in individuals owning different numbers of non-traditional pets acquired from varied pathways? Uh, and looking at that different numbers of non-traditional pets kind of uh, 
establishing different uh, levels of of experience, I guess you could say, in the pet trade. So the mes methods I use, this is probably my most traditional social science method um, approach in my dissertation. I did a online questionnaire um, using the LAPS scale, and I sent it to owners of fish, reptiles, amphibians, insects, and arachnids. Uh, and I did this through several different methods, Qualtrics, FWC Pet Amnesty Day adopters, um, Florida permit holders, herpetological societies and reptile rescues. Um, I, I sought those out either through, uh, through online searches of these places or uh, reaching out to, let's say, the herpetological society and just inviting them to share it with their members without asking for their emails. And then in, to uh, assess and analyze, I use non-parametric tests uh, to look at the results. So what are those results? So the results, I got a total of 1,280 non-traditional pet owners uh, uh, completed the LAPS survey. So we can start looking at differences in attachment based on uh, different attributes. So looking at owners who acquired the pet for themselves versus those who did not acquire the pet for themselves. So for example, owner acquired it, acquired it for themselves. They either bought it themselves, maybe they caught it in the wild for themselves, whereas the owner did not acquire the pet for themselves. We're looking at, uh, oops, we're looking at they either received it from the uh, uh, from a, a loved one passing or from a child bought it or wanted it and then left the home and then the parents had it. So in which they're currently caring for the pet, but they did not actively seek it out. And we see, not too surprising, that owners that acquired the pets for themselves had increased attachment to these pets. Um, but some other interesting findings were the owners of a non-traditional pet and a traditional pet. So that we did this, I did this with dogs and cats. Um, I just put the dog up here for, for space, but when the owners owned non-traditional pets and a traditional pet, they had higher levels of attachment than those that just owned the non-traditional pet. Oh, you're not seeing the mouse. So I'm sort of like, oh, there we go. Um, and then what was really interesting, what I was really looking at was um, the differences in attachment um, for number of pets owned. So individuals who only owned one non-traditional pet had the lowest level of attachment. Those that had over 21 pets had um the second lowest attachment. And then we see those that had six to 20 pets had the highest levels of attachment. And this is just demonstrating what I just told you, but at the significance level. So for the discussion of what, is, what does this mean? What's the takeaway from this research? Previous studies focused on reducing introductions associated the pet trade uh, with the recommendation of reaching out and providing information at the point of sale of these pets. And while that is likely still a good idea, my findings suggest that there is a need to identify methods to target audiences with preventative messaging that does not that of individuals that did not actively choose to own their non-traditional pet. Um, and we could do that. We can kind of spread that along to all those that had lower levels of attachment, owners of one pet, those breeders, collectors, owners of more than 21 pets, um, and owners of only non-traditional pets. But I think it's really important to note that I did still only look at levels of attachment to these pets. I didn't look at correlation between attachments and releases. So this would also be areas um, and individuals and groupings that we could potentially uh, look into for assessing correlation between attachment and possible releases. So because I did um, several uh, very different case studies, you'll see that we're gonna take a little turn over to big cats. <laughs> These are a little bit uh, more obviously charismatic. So ca big cats are charismatic species with both a critical role within ecological and socioeconomic systems. They have a recognized critical importance um, and that outsized attention due to, attention due to that charisma. Um, despite all this, they are still experiencing global declines. And these global declines have been uh, studied and attributed to anthropogenic actions or actions of humans. So social science is a critical component of understanding why these declines may still be happening, even though there's a lot of attention and what we might be able to do about that. 
Um, and despite, and despite this, like I said, despite the, um, despite the relationship of big cat declines that it has with humans, previous studies have identified a lack of social science and interdisciplinary efforts within lion and um, panthera species research. And just to kind of relating back to that first slide of discussion, discussing the uses of social science typically would come in at the end. So it makes sense that a lot of previous research didn't have a large focus on social science and human dimensions. So I wanted to use a quantitative social science method to assess on a larger scale research trends and gaps in, in big cat research. So my research questions is exactly that. What is the current state of big cat peer reviewed literature in terms of authorship, author affiliation, affiliation location, and journal publication, journal publication? And by analyzing patterns in keywords and key phrases, look for current trends. So how did I do this? I used a bibliometric analysis. I used um, the software VOS Viewer, uh, and I it was a fun, you know, fun uh, package to use and and explore data. So I highly recommend to anyone who wants to look at large uh, large pieces of data. So I looked at it. What's great about the bibliometric analysis is it does quantitative analysis as well as um, you can conduct qualitative analysis for large data sets and broad scopes of work. So in identifying big cat literature for the analysis, I grouped the five traditionally recognized big cat species within P Panthera and looked at that literature. So you see lion, tiger, jaguar, leopard, snow leopard. And then I did group an additional four big cat species that are, that there's anecdotally included in the big cats, but not as traditionally considered big cats. So, um, these additional four big cat species are recognized by Wildlife Conservation Society, Panthera, and National Geographic as big cats. But like I said, they're, you may or may not see them included. So I thought it would be interesting to, to compare um, between the more traditionally five big cats and the additional four. All right, so the results um, I analyzed a total of 6,031 scientific articles, and my findings demonstrated that the U.S. Um, is a top publisher for both the main five, um, so 2.5 uh, times the citations than the next leading country, and um, the additional four where we actually five times the citations in the next leading country. Um, but interesting, if we look at these visuals, we see that the main five, so here we have these visuals, the main five, the most prolific countries are their own nodes right here. So there's co-authoring outside of the top five producers. Um, whereas with the additional four, three of the top five countries cluster together. Uh, so we see that the top authorship in the additional four are co-authoring um, in that cluster. And I didn't get too into this, but I did, upon um, looking at this, speculate that the additional four clustering of U.S., Brazil, and Argentina may be related to literature on um, the cougar, puma, puma, panther, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I had I have suggestions for future research related to this, um, but that was just something interesting that I also noticed. Um, but didn't get to dive into too much. And just to kind of give an idea of the quantity and the location of publications in comparison to where the species are. So we see the red dots represent the quantity in comparison of publications. And then we see my addition of the big cats just to kind of give an idea of roughly where they are, these images aren't to scale or anything. <laughs> and we could see again, the same with the additional four. Um, we see that kind of spread and where the top public publishers are coming out of. Um, and interesting in looking at publication outlets, um, we could see 
the top five publication outlets for the main five big cats. And then just for comparison, we see the top five publication outlets for the additional four big cats. And I just highlight these um, because articles related to all nine of the big cat species were published in 729 different sources. However, there was a notable skew with a relatively small number, number of journals making up the majority of publication outlets. So in total, 46% of all articles were published in only 30 different journals. And the top five journals you'll see for both, for both the main five and additional four big cats counted for approximately one fifth of their respective data sets. Um, and of all these journals, the they all had headquarters in the global north um, and predominantly in the US or UK. Um, additional results looking at my keyword analysis, um, or excuse my co-word and co-word analysis. Um, we see within, um, we see the human wildlife conflict. So going back to those anthropogenic effects of uh, uh, impacting big cats, we see that human wildlife conflict is in the top 10 keywords for both the main five and additional four big cats. Um, but it's just interesting that there's no other social science keywords uh, within here, or typically, I should say, typically related to social science. Um, and then in reviewing, so if we review the average publication year of abstract terms um, related to social science research, we actually see an earlier uh, use of social science terms uh, in within the big, the four big cat species. So this may indicate an earlier adoption um, and use of social science methods in, in the additional four big cat species. Um, oh yeah, and oh, that's what, and that's what, sorry, I was just checking my own notes. Uh, <laughs> in those additional four big cats, I think though, so what is also interesting and I think uh, should, deserves more looking into, deeper looking into, is although there is this earlier adoption or appears to be an earlier adoption of these social science related terminology, we still see human wildlife conflict coming in at number six compared to number two for the main five big cats. So it's just an interesting, it's an interesting split that there seems to be an increased uh, use of social science methods early on, but there's less of the use of human wildlife conflict. Um, and there's something to look to look into that to see why there might be kind of this uh, split there. Another interesting finding and an additional metric I was able to use was the Web of Science Keyword Plus. And that's really interesting because the, um, the Keyword Plus is basically keywords that like AI uh, Web of Science generates from, from the uh, from the articles. And I think that's interesting because it can get those like latent words or, or concepts that are used that maybe the author might not even be including in their keywords or, or uh, may not fit in the keywords. And we see that in, in reviewing the human carnivore conflict node right here, we see that um, there's high instances of, of connection with national park, we see here. And this was for the additional four. So the main five and the additional four. So we see that human carnivore conflict is often used, the term is often used with the term national park. So while there are going to be higher instances of, of, of human wildlife conflict within and around national parks, perceptions and protections are likely different than unprotected areas and achieving human wildlife coexistence, it'll be critical to look outside of national parks. Oh, look, I squirted it. So for the discussion, as I went over, the US produced the most publications and there was a notable skew of publication outlets. Although it's critical to note, and this was something going into my research, I, I knew would be uh, something that either needs to be looked at further or, uh, but the web of science country slash region of publication captures the location of the author's affiliation at the time of publication. So of course that doesn't provide us the full context of the researchers familiarity with the location of the study area. We have, of course, international um, researchers 
at all different universities all across the globe. So just by looking at their affiliation at the time of that publication doesn't provide all the insight. Um, so I think future studies should and um, include a co-citation analysis, but even more importantly, I think qualitative studies with the researchers that are doing the research on the ground that, and they can provide insight into their backgrounds, also a deeper understanding of what they feel are the struggles, the barriers, and the gaps in big cat, um, in big cat research. Um, but even with even with the country and region potentially not capturing the author's full understanding of the location they're re under uh, they're researching, Global North is still demonstrating an outsized influence on global big cat research management and conservation um, through the ideologies and views that are going to be shared by the universities that the uh, that are affiliated with these publications. Um, and it's critical to, to open up the research to a diversity of backgrounds to increase problem solving, idea generation, and cultural literacy that's necessary for these anthropogenic threats to big cats. Um, additionally, going along with this research, um, uh, there ha there's, or excuse me, I should say related to this research is the increasing recognition of helicopter or parachute mm -hmm. science, um, which is researchers from the Go global north acquiring data from within the global south, analyzing the data and then publishing the findings all with little or no involvement from local scientists and communities. Um, and this helicopter research arises in large part due to an imbalance of power. Um, so what happens is this research ag agenda setting is dominated by the global north and the Global North funders and researchers and these collaborative efforts with the Global South are beginning with an inherent unequal partnership. Um, so this lack of inclusion or this lack of balance of power um, of Global South researchers within the agenda setting phase invites the development of um, research objectives that lack consideration of local needs and priorities. So this may foster political tensions and hinder both conservation and collaborative efforts. Um, and interesting related to that is this idea of the difference in attitudes between Global North and Global South towards academic publishing, which I uh, is also related, uh, different from the helicopter science, but I think related to my findings of dominance of the Global North. And we just see that there, uh, there's a communication mis mismatch in which the global South researchers and practitioners experience barriers to accessing journals, um, often due to subscription rates. And then global North researchers are limited in their access to knowledge and information derived from global South, research global South researchers and practitioners. You can see that here in this diagram from GASA, um, where the researchers producing peer reviewed literature disseminated by journals we have the practitioners producing project reporting, often disseminated through hard copy reports, institutional websites, and we don't see much connection between these journals getting to practitioner or even these hard copy reports getting to researchers. Um, and while, <clears throat> excuse me, and not pictured here, but another difficulty in, in access to journals is the increasing prevalence of article processing charges um, and they're recognized as a financial barrier. Well, actually in my, let's see. There. So in this graph we also see, or this table, we see that of the top five um, APCs or only one, I think it's in both, only one journal in both uh, were the APCs optional and they could, and they can, um, have the op option to publish via subscription, so no cost or open access. Um, and there are, so journals may offer some form of APC assistance, um, and re but research has found that Global South researchers are still having to pay APCs, further compounding those barriers to Global South presence in academic publishing. And then, oops, oh, spoiler, pandas, next. 
So for um, the rest of my discussion, the big cat research terminology uh, kind of went over a lot of the discussion in there. Um, but we do see uh, that recent increase in usage of socio-ecological terminology with the four big cat publications. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to go further and, and really compare uh, uh, compare the numbers of um, and progress of uh, conservation of the four additional species compared to the, the five traditional big cat species to see if timelines of conservation efforts and you know numbers increases or decreases line up with increased social social science uses. Um, and for social for now for the depth of social science. So looking at the terminology, we saw mention of it, but um, there's also a lack of depth of the social science research when looking at the terminology most often used. Um, there appears to be a focus on those tangible metrics such as depredation events, uh, de depredation events um, of big cats of livestock um, compared to the intangible, more theory-based metrics such as values, attitudes, and norms. Attitudes was really one of the only intangible theory-based metrics that would often be in those social science papers, or excuse me, would also often be um, a term used. Um, and even within attitudes, I mean, even with at within attitudes and social science, like attitudes are so broad that uh, it could really capture a lot without having a basis of comparison. So with theory being a critical component of social science research for both validity and generalizing to other, to other uh, groups, there's really a need to introduce more theory into this, into this, uh, into this research. Finally, bringing up the uh, my panda chapter. <laughs> so um, another, probably potentially the most well known of the charismatic species, the most identifiable identifiable of the charismatic species. Um, we have giant pandas in the media. So they're a flagship species. Uh, they're charismatic, they're popular, they're symbolic, they're um, inextricably linked with conservation as the they became the World Wildlife uh, Federation symbol in 1961. Um, and since then, really, the image of the panda has been linked with conservation as well as pervading um, social, social symbols. And while there have been, um, so I'm interested in looking at the focus of media messaging on pandas. And while there have been studies looking at media influence concerning wildlife, they typically focus on divisive species. And I was interested in looking at one you would consider probably not divisive. I mean, I'm sure there might be people who don't like pandas, but <laughs> not, not traditionally divisive um, because there are still multiple perceptions that can be held uh, or that people can hold uh, towards these charismatic species, which would in turn impact public attitudes and behavior surrounding conservation of this species, um, which is also with the uh, panda being a flagship species and the protection of panda protecting um, the area that protects other species, as well as being a symbol of conservation attitudes towards the general protection of pandas is important for uh, understanding conservation and motive and conservation motives of those that are uh, using the uh, panda as a symbol. And a really good a really good uh, temporal point to study was the 2016 IUCN decision to downlist the giant panda from endangered to vulnerable. That gave a specific point in time where could look at media before and after to see if there was a shift with such a significant conservation event. So I used framing as my theoret theoretical background and framing is defined as the repeated use of a central organizing idea and exposure that can lead to the formation of specific perceptions in an audience by assigning greater importance to some topics over others. And the, while framing theory consists of these three steps, frame building, frame setting, consequences of framing, you'll see um, this red square is because I focus on frame setting for my research. 
My research also provided a very preliminary look at symbolism, um, but very preliminary. Uh, and <clears throat> symbolism is that additional communication technique that elicits emotions and informs social constructs and helps shape public attitudes and behaviors. And I know that sounds very familiar to frame setting, oops. Uh, but to kind of help uh, create the difference between frame setting and symbolism, framing is the process of emphasizing or repeatedly presenting an idea. And that may evoke a particular uh, interpretation or reaction from the intended audience. So more simply put, it's how the information is being presented. Whereas a symbol refers to an association between something that is visible and something that is invisible, intangible, often through the use of language. So for example, symbolic associations uh, assigned to wildlife often form as a result of oversimplified public interpretation of a select a selection of simplistic characteristics. So you might've heard some of these foxes representing deceitfulness, rabbits associated with promiscuity, um, <clears throat> associating the trait of bravery with lions, and connecting black cats with evil or bad luck. So that's kind of looking, it's a difference, it's slight, but there's a difference between the two. My research questions were focused on how is the giant panda, how is giant panda news framed by English speaking media, which um, for future reference would uh, looking at Chinese speaking media will be critical. Was there a shift in the short term of media framing of the giant panda after their downlisting by the IUCN? And what types of symbolism are represented in giant panda media? I think I only have 10 minutes, so we'll kind of go quickly. Um, so my methods, how did I conduct this research? I collected uh, newspaper, newswire, and press releases and web-based publications from the database Nexus Uni. And I looked the year before and then the year after the IUCN press release date of the downlisting. And I did topic modeling, which is, uh, excuse me, which I use uh, the specific form of latent derelict allocation, LDA topic modeling. And I did that in STATA. Um, and it just take and the traditional cleaning methods of, of topic modeling. If anyone wants more details on that, you can ask me, but I'm sure those minutia details are not needed right now. <laughs> so LDA topic modeling is one of the most popular topic modeling methods. Um, and in general, it assumes this hierarchical structure where there's a collection of documents. And within that collection of documents is a collection of topics. And you identify those collection of topics by looking at a collection of words, words that are often used, um, words that are commonly used across similar articles. And what's really interesting about LDA topic modeling is you can receive two data points. At the end, you receive the corpus level measurements. So you can look, you can find the prevalence of a topic within a data set based on the percentage of documents in which that topic is dominant, right? So we look at the percentage of topics covered in the whole data set, but then you can look at document level measures and actually look at the proportion of each topic within an individual news story or document. So it's, it's, that's an interesting way to look at um, the topics within there, as you can see it broadly and specifically. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna kind of skip ahead. I had this fun little activity where um, in order to, to so the, the topics are, to, the topic numbers are selected by the researcher. So you have to assess for topic coherence. Um, and there's a few ways to do it. And one of the ways is to look for word intrusion. Um, and that's fun. And you use these word clouds to look for word intrusion to see if the topic numbers you have fit, uh, fit the data. So you look at these word clouds to see if you can identify um, a, single, a single topic roughly within that data set. I was just going to have, we'll just do it for one, but if you were to look at this uh, word cloud, would you see roughly what a topic might be related to these words, if that kind of looks all cohesive? Yeah. 
Eating. Oh my gosh. Yes. Births and cubs. You guys nailed it. So births and cubs. Um, and then we have, I just to show, you see conservation efforts and threats. Okay. I'm narrowing down. I know that these topics are cohesive. This one was a little more difficult, but when you actually look, this was Smithsonian National Zoos, this Mo Smithsonian National Washington and Bay Bay, the very famous Smithsonian panda. Um, let's see. So to break it down, I'm just going to go quickly because we're almost out of time. But to break it down, I did find um, 10 topics within the, the pre and post downlisting with five shared across the pre and post downlisting and then um, five that were unique to either the pre or post town listing. And then I grouped these into, so those are the topics that were identified by the topic modeling. And then I saw and grouped them into uh, frames. So we could see that they're really broke down to be three frames that were repeated in the, uh, in the media. We see panda reproduction, panda diplomacy, Panda science and conservation. Um, oops, but interestingly, we see here in orange, panda reproduction is what remained consistent. We see that panda reproduction remained consistent in the news pre and post downlisting, but we do see this switch. We see that panda diplomacy, panda diplomacy was a little more prevalent. Um, and then we see after the IUCN downlisting, we actually, not too surprising, we see an increase in panda science and conservation um, and this decrease in panda diplomacy, but we see that reproduction stayed of interest. I'm gonna just skip the symbolism because we're running out of time, but you'll see that um, pandas as sexualized symbols, pandas as political symbols and conservation symbols similar to the framing emerged. So we see kind of this uh, repeating theme and also like these are some ridiculous headlines. Lousy libidos, why do pandas have so little sex? Feel free to read that news article in your free time. So for frame um, for the discussion, framing of giant pandas in the media, um, while the number of topics increased based on the conservation event, the frames remain consistent, identifying three distinct areas of interest within the media and the public. Uh, this is useful for understanding of um, what interests the public, what can we use conservation events as a time of heightened interest to communicate uh, conservation goals of this species? Um, what are areas that, that the public's already interested or that's already being written about that we could maybe uh, use to the advantage of promoting conservation? Um, in terms of the downlisting event, uh, interesting, I didn't get to, to dive into it, but concerns pertaining to the decision to downlist the giant panda included the potential reduction of public enthusiasm and involvement for the species. So potentially the public would hear that they were downlisted, that pandas are doing great and we don't need to protect them anymore. Um, but actually it was really interesting that the discussions of the panda and IUCN downlisting included different opinions, efforts to save giant pandas paying off, China concerned over the downgrade of pandas conservation status. So there's actually um, more interest in the media and the public of hearing the different sides versus uh, just kind of the headline of they're downlisted, they're doing better. And again, um, just kind of skipping over symbolism, but to talk about the prominence of the sexualization and asexualization of pandas along with panda reproduction being a main frame, um, we see that we have these opposing narratives that reproduction might be a significant threat to pandas um, whereas that's not the case in the research and the understanding of threats to pandas. Um, so we might be purporting this narrative that pandas are incapable of taking care of, taking care of themselves, which could impact funding um, and have dire consequences on funding for protecting these species. So overall, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, conclusions and future directions, we talked a lot or I talked a lot about some of these while I was going through. So I just wanted to highlight um, future directions for each of my chapters, because I think that's critical uh, to move the research forward. So I think chapter one, there needs to be a studies assessing potential correlation between attachment and releases. In chapter two, we need future research to assess barriers to entry for underrepresented research in big cat um, literature. And then chapter three, 
uh, an in-depth analysis of giant panda symbolism is needed. So with that, I just dedicate this, my dissertation and all I do in the memory of my sister who passed in 2020 and my beautiful daughter, who's my new purpose in life, Wanda Lynn, and just my acknowledgements um, to everyone involved, huge acknowledgement, acknowledgements to my advisor, Vanessa, for being critical, if not the main reason I was able to finish this. <laughs> so with that, thank you. <laughs> And we're almost out of time. I don't know if there's questions. Kind of started powering through at the end. <laughs> Do you think with the recent Panda news? Yes. Are you going to take a look again? Thank you for bringing that up because that was totally in my notes and I didn't go through it. But yeah, so the recent decision of the Pandas China uh, did not resign the loan of the pandas to the Smithsonian National Zoo. And I don't know if you caught it, but they went home in a tearful goodbye. I think November 17th, I think it was. Um, and that's a great question because that's exactly what I would be interested in doing next or suggesting would be to take ex kind of exactly what I did and do the year before the, potentially the announcement, you could pick maybe the announcement, maybe the day that they left, that might be more when people, you know, really recognized that that was occurring um, and look the before and after of this decision, because um, there's also been like recent, I know, you know, pres the presidents have met and discussed potentially, you know, reforming that Panda loan program. So definitely I would like, I think you could totally just do this whole thing again with that and, and see what, what, what you get. Hi, Diane. Uh, thank you for our presentation. Thank you. I am curious to know if uh, there is a difference between the uh, human conflict in the different cats, like the five cats. If, what are the main conflicts or are they fair? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I um, So my understanding, I mean, the most I see of for big cats in general, which is not exactly what your question is to differentiate, but are those predation events of those big cats predating on livestock? Um, so going off of that, I would say along the lines of like the bigger cat species potentially predating more or predating bigger livestock, which might be harder to, to uh, deal with that conflict than perhaps like taking smaller um, livestock. Um, but also encroachment being an issue. So species with bigger range versus smaller range. So I don't know the exact question, but I actually think that's a really good point of uh, one of the one of my future research directions. I, I would be really interested in kind of going back to the micro and looking at each species and and the kind of associated affiliation author affiliations with that. So I think it could provide some insights to kind of go big picture and then back to small picture. Okay. Are snow leopards more prone to encroachment, whereas big cat uh, lions are predation events or something like that? So I think that's a really good point that should get more, more look at. Uh, I should look more at. Anybody online? I don't see any messages. Thank you very much. It's really interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you. So how do you sell this research findings to your department manager? Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what this is. A lot of money. So how do you want to sell it to people? Sell my like sell yeah, my yeah, research sell myself. Why should I do this? Oh uh, well, oh my gosh. What a great <laughs> question. Put on the spot. Didn't know this was a job interview. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I think, well, in general, the techniques, so I think the techniques are very, uh, useful cross species, right? So looking at big picture bibliometric analysis for big cats that can translate into looking at other species, looking at the big picture of where there are gaps and trends. So there's, 
not only looking at other species, but beginning to look at comparisons between different species groups to see, uh, okay, so big cats, there's a lack of social science, but maybe this other area has greater use of social science, but the species are still uh, declining. So looking at comparisons like that. Um, I think the topic modeling, I, I mean, that goes without, well, I, I really picked these methods because I, I thought learning them would be really useful in being able to apply them across different species. And I think the topic modeling is really useful of getting an idea for managers of where people's thoughts are and saving time and money if there's a managerial uh, position or method that you can kind of seek out opinions on that or relate like something similar. And if we see that public uh, attitudes towards a certain type of research or certain type of management action were not favorable in the past. That could be saving of time and finances and money of either trying to push it forward or, or um, identifying like a different method that was more, uh, uh, more favorable of the public. Um, and then for the lap, for specifically the laps, that's uh, that's definitely specific to the pet trade. Um, and I, that's such a such a main uh, contributing factor to invasions that understanding, okay, recognizing that this uh, established scale might be providing insight into attachment and then looking at that correlation, you might be able to kind of reduce the amount of uh, releases related to that if we have proper resources in place. Was that good? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.